Hey, everybody. This is the show where we are incredibly inspired by the love and change that local nonprofits bring to their communities. And we believe that speakers and nonprofit professionals deserve the chance to share their stories, collaborate, and network with their communities and sector. So without further ado, you're listening to Nonprofit Connect, a podcast by Rogue Creatives hosted by me, Matt Barnes. Let's go. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Nonprofit Connect with Matt Barnes. I'm Matt Barnes. And this over across from me, you can't see her, but she is across from me at the table. That's Tiffany Pope. (laughs) Hey, everybody. So we are here doing intros this morning for these podcasts. But the other night had a networking event we went to for the Newport Beach Chamber of Commerce. And it was at Pelican Hill Golf Course, which I've never been to because I don't golf. And as Tiffany would say, I don't sport. (laughs) Right. He's a NARP. She calls me a NARP, which (laughs) tell them what that means. Non-athletic regular person. Which I think is mostly insulting because Tiffany's athletic. She's like on the university softball team and (laughs) and whatever. And she's like teaching my kids to be athletic and whatever. And I don't do athletic stuff. But we went to this golf thing and there was a little bit of a like a contest. Mm -hmm. There was a putting contest and then a chipping contest. Yeah. Nobody did well at the putting contest. No. No. We all (laughs) sucked at that. But then we get over to the chipping thing and they've got these net things you got to hit the ball into. Yep. And how did you do, Tiff? Tell them how your hits went. (laughs) They were super athletic, right? Not so good. No, not great. (laughs) Not good at all. How many did you make? Zero. Okay. Yeah. Now, then I stepped up there and I hit the ball. And where did the first ball go? Right in the net. Right in the net. Yes. The three-point net. Wait. Nope. That's not the right one. This one. There it is. Yeah. No. No. It's impressive. No. (laughs) Yeah. So I am no longer a NARP. I am now a (laughs) athletic regular person. I'm an ARP, (laughs) I guess. Or just just an app. Or an ARP. Okay. Watch it. (laughs) Watch it. Yeah. You know what? Whether you sport or not, it doesn't matter. You're welcome here. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. (laughs) In fact, if you sport a lot, you might not be welcome here, (laughs) Tiffany. Anyway, so (laughs) let's get to our topic of the day, our guest of the day. We've got a really cool guest joining us today. Her name is Maria Yurakova. She is a charity sector professional. Professional. Wow. She's got 20 years of fundraising experience and has raised over, wait for it, $20 $20 million for a range of different causes. Wow. $20 million. Wow. $20 million. $20 million. $20 million. $20 million. I can't talk. <laughs> Maria has founded not one but two nonprofit companies, Charity Search Group, which is a recruitment agency specializing in the nonprofit sector, and also a fundraising agency called Leapfrog Fundraising. She's super accomplished. She's got all kinds of great insights. She has a background in the education sector. She's got an MBA in marketing. She's very smart. Wow. And she knows her stuff. She's a boss lady. She's a boss lady. So I think mostly we talked about recruitment and finding the right people and how diversity plays, all those things. It's really a great conversation. You're going to love it. So stay tuned because right after this, we're going to be back with Maria Yurakova from Charity Search Group. All right. I'm here with Maria Yurakova. Hi, Maria. Hi there, Matt. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to talk shop about all things nonprofits today. Yes. All right. Before we get into that, we always open with three random questions. I have a long list of random questions, and then I use a randomizer to choose three of them. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) You have like the little sound that says, this is the right. I need that. (laughs) All right, go. All right, here we go. What is your idea of a perfect weekend? That's a good question. Well, I like to read books a lot. So usually a perfect weekend would probably involve like a good three hour stretch of uninterrupted book reading, ideally on a beach next to a pool or backyard or some outdoor activity. I also play a lot of tennis. So my perfect weekends also involve me reliving my fantasies of playing the US Open final. So there's me on a tennis court out there. Yeah, that and probably something like a movie or some other art and culture activity of some sort. I would say that too. That sounds like a good weekend. I like it. I'd be down for that weekend. That's a good weekend. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? I have asked this question of so many people over the years. (laughs) Turning back time. 
Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, I think that if you figure that out, get the lottery numbers a week ahead, everything else will sort of follow from there. We always think of the big things we'd go back and change, but it's usually the little things like, oh my gosh, I forgot to hit save. Just go back 30 seconds and, (laughs) 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 right? It's all those little things like, oh, I did that one tiny thing and it just ruined my whole day. If I could just fix that, that thing. All right, last one is, if you could wake up anywhere tomorrow, where would you wake up? Oh, wow. Okay. That's a good question. Let me think for a second. New York, the U.S. Open starts tomorrow. Oh, there you go. Nice. And where are you today? Washington, D.C. Awesome. Is that where you live? Yeah. So Charity Search Group is headquartered in Washington, D.C., so we're just outside of it. So that sort of is where I've been for the last few years. Okay, nice. Let's go ahead and dive in to you and what you do. What's your origin story? What brought you into the nonprofit world? My origin story, that sounds like a superhero. (laughs) (laughs) I think I am probably one of those people that end up sort of falling into the nonprofit sector by chance. I think at least every other fundraiser or nonprofit professional I've ever spoken to sort of has that kind of a story of where you try to job, usually as a student or sometime right after graduation. And it's stuck and you kind of liked it and you just moved on and you never thought that's what you went to school for, but that's what you ended up in. So that sort of is my story. I vividly remember the day I was looking for a summer job, second semester, first year. And I saw this like poster on like next to an elevator type of thing. It was like, oh, we're looking to hire telethon or phonathon fundraisers. And by the way, the office is in the basement. So take the elevator down. And I was like, oh, I wonder what that is. And that's sort of what ended up being my summer job. And then I kept it for the entirety of my university time and then ended up working in the alumni office after I graduated for a little while. And then I moved into a whole bunch of other higher education institutions. So that's what I ended up. That's how I started. What kept me going in it, I think, is two things. I think it's given me exposure and an opportunity to meet people that I normally would have never thought I would cross paths with. And getting the opportunity to hear people's stories who are sort of at a very different point in life than you, particularly when you talk to people who have graduated a long time ago, it's fascinating. And then being able to see sort of the tangibility of philanthropic investments from sort of like the ability to give back and impact the next generation of folks and the pivotal changes that can happen in someone's life when they get a scholarship or when they get access to mentorship or activities or whatever else universities fund. That's amazing. And being able to sort of be in both of those worlds at the same time is very fulfilling. Yeah, I would imagine. That sounds great. And so now tell us about what you're doing now with Charity Search Group and your role there. So I am the CEO of a talent recruitment firm that works exclusively with the nonprofit sector. So halfway through this journey in the higher ed space, I would say, It kind of got to the point where I was like, well, there's so many other organizations with so many amazing missions that I would love to be able to help them all out, but it can only work for one at a time. And so for a while, I was like, how can I do that? And I think no matter what part of the nonprofit sector you're in, talent is the thing that everybody's after because it's so scarce and it's so difficult to get it right to keep your people, to be able to develop people. And everyone is so resource constrained that I was like, if I can help the little guy or little gal in getting access to better talent, I will be able to deliver on a whole bunch of different missions that I care about without having to directly work for them. So that's where I think I can still be impactful in the nonprofit sector without necessarily being in the sort of in-house, so to speak. And is that a new kind of concept that you came up with? Because, I mean, obviously, talent recruitment and all that for for for-profit space has has been there forever. But I guess I just don't hear that much directed to nonprofits. I think executive search has been around in the nonprofit sector for a while. And it has this like aura about it being super expensive and only like big organizations can afford it. The thing is the big organizations don't actually have to use it very often because they have big brands and they pay well. So people naturally gravitate towards those roles. And then on the other hand, there's always been this temp agency staffing aspect that a lot of nonprofits would take advantage of if they sort of have a ton of roles that are very frontline focused that they need to hire a ton of entry level for, for, and then they would outsource that piece. And sort of where we come in is in between those two spaces, right? So like, what do you do if you have a critical role, like a director of development on your team that's vacant, you can't find the right person, 
when you don't have a good fundraiser, when your role is vacant, the ability to fund the mission of the organization sort of starts to suffer. And so that's where we come in and we help organizations, primarily small and medium sized, to get access to talent that they normally don't have the tools, the time, or the expertise internally to be able to navigate the market. We still do our fair bit of executive director searches, especially for small organizations. And I really enjoy working with boards and seeing how their thinking evolves around because it's not really about, oh, we just need to figure out who to hire. It's more like, well, where is this organization going? What kind of leader do we need to take us there? And sort of asking those kinds of deep questions. That's what makes it super exciting. And I think it's really important because your local humane society or a homeless shelter or a food bank, those are the organizations that really make community important and worth living in. And so they need help and access it. Like the right leader in those organizations has impact on the community and sort of ripple effect. So that's really important to me is to enable those kinds of boards to make the right decision. Yeah. So you end up working with boards more directly to staff out and make find the right leadership. Yeah, I mean, I work with boards more. My staff works with hiring managers that are looking for anything from a development associate to a finance manager, to an HR person, to a director of development or anything in between. We're a team of 10, so we tend to cover all levels of the organization, both in terms of depth and and across in terms of functions. Okay. Do you work a lot with startup nonprofits or more mid-level nonprofits? So we've done quite a bit of startup nonprofits. And it's really fascinating to sort of see. It's a tricky change that a lot of times it's underestimated as to how important it is when you go from like a founder-based nonprofit. Oh, I need to hire the first executive director because I don't want to do it anymore. Or I'm ready for my first hire, whatever that is. And it's not only about who it's going to work for this person in terms of skill set, but then it's the personalities because it's a small team you got to get along. And then it's also, well, wait a minute. Now we need to figure out What is our job descriptions? What is our PTO policy? And like when you start hiring, you got to think about all these other things that HR type stuff, right? Shop of two or three people, you don't have to. So a lot of that kind of work, but also a lot of what I think is a trend in the industry right now is a ton of boards and small-ish nonprofits that have had the same executive director for like a decade or 15 or 17 or 25 years that that person is now retiring or moving on from the organization. And the board, because of the board terms, has to hire an ED for the first time. And so it's like a new experience for everyone, even though the organization may have been around for a long time. Sure. I can definitely see that. What do you feel like has been your biggest learning or contribution that's been helpful to really help these nonprofits grow? I think one of our clients put it well. It's like, Maria will get you where you need to be, not necessarily where you want to be. And I think It's asking those tough questions and trying to understand, are you really ready for this kind of hire? Like, are you actually going to utilize a person? Because everybody comes to me and says, I want someone who's very experienced and having done this and having done that. And my question always is, well, do you really think we can find someone who can command a $250,000 salary and doesn't have access to admin support? It's just, we're going to lose them in five days. (laughs) So it's like thinking through some of that, I think is important. But what is important to me on the candidate side is empowering folks to make the right decision for them when it comes to joining an organization. And so building a process where there is a bit more transparency and everyone is not in this kind of like a dating stage where it's only the best foot forward and nobody actually talks about the real problems in an organization. Or you go into an interview and you spend answering 15 questions. And then when a time comes for you to ask questions, you have like three minutes. Uh, like really try to not do that so that people have access and feel empowered to ask all the questions, whether it's through us or in the interview stage, because a job has to work for you in terms of your life, whatever that setup is. But also you need to know what you're getting yourself into. It doesn't mean that it all has to be perfect. Like some people like to fix broken things. We just want to tell them that ahead of time. Yeah. <laughs> so that I think has been uh, refreshing and it keeps me going. Nice. One of the biggest conversations that I end up having with almost every interview on this podcast is around the idea of a scarcity mindset with nonprofits and can't spend money on something that would be considered overhead. Marketing's an issue, you know, this kind of thing. I would imagine that you would fall into that category of something that people would be like, oh, I don't know if we can spend money on that. How do you bring people along in that? How do you help them understand the value of investing in themselves by hiring someone like you? The one piece is I think we price ourselves very competitively so that organizations are not scared. So for example, we have a flat fee 
model where in the executive search space, many times search firms would have like a formula that would charge the percentage of time, right? And so if you're looking for executives, that first year salary can be pretty chunky as a percentage. I don't really bother with that kind of model. What we do is like, well, how much support do you need? Like, do you need us to come in and do A to Z? Or do you already have your internal HR team that can schedule all the meetings and do you have already written the job description, done all of that? So we're going to like pare this down because I think it's important that we don't duplicate resources when it comes to nonprofits. So there's a lot of flexing that happens in that space. But the other thing that I do is... I talk to boards and hiring managers from a time perspective, because I think time is our most valuable resource and everybody kind of understands that. And so I lay it out as my team and I are prepared to come in and spend between 40 and 80 hours of actual work to get you a hire. And so that's like the time we're going to spend interviewing, writing the job description, talking to everybody who may or may not be interested in this role and like a whole bunch of stuff that happens in between. Like, So do you have 80 hours to spend on this in the next two months? And like, what is that going to cost the organization in whatever formula you can come up with? And so that's where I think the gears start turning me like, well, wait a minute. That's like a full-time person for two, three months. So whose job can I take away their regular duties and give this to them? And that's where I think is one aspect of it that people start thinking through the cost. The other piece of this is, well, do you actually even have the expertise to do that? So if you are a small organization, you hire for a role once every two, three years, you don't know the market trends or a lot of the details on the nuances of what's competitive, what's not, and all that. So is it really worth it for you to spend a whole bunch of money, for example, posting a role on Indeed and seeing what happens? Because that's like a a strategy. (laughs) That's not going to get you very far, but you're also going to lose two months figuring this out. So do you have the time to do that? Right. You're going to lose two months and not get what you actually need, probably. Yeah. In so many areas with nonprofits, I think that we've been trained to believe that you can't spend the money on these things and the money's got to go straight to the programs and all that. But the reality is it sounds great on the surface, but once you start digging in, it's you don't have to go very far before you realize that kind of all falls apart and you need to invest your organization to be able to do the things that you are saying you're going to do and do it effectively. And so often, I think I'm imagining you're probably seeing the same thing. You know, you get nonprofits are started by somebody who is very passionate about one thing. They do that thing very well, and they really don't know how to run a business or how to recruit or any of those other things. But they also feel like I can't pay somebody. I can't ask for help because of that kind of stigma. So that's been a big for us with Nonprofit Connect and just personally been a big kind of mission of mine is like, let's get people to start realizing, like, no, we have to invest in those things. That's how we actually will make more of an impact. I think that we've made some progress there. A lot of my startup clients and like organizations, particularly organizations that are looking to advance equity and social justice in some aspect, they tend to get it a little bit faster and they're not scared of investments because they come from a, you know, we're just going to try it and see what happens because clearly what we've been doing so far hasn't been working. I like that as a refreshing approach. But the other thing that, and I had this conversation with, I'm known for being very direct. (laughs) Most of the clients I think come to appreciate that, but I was having a tough conversation. Actually, it wasn't even one of our clients. It was a potential client who was that same scenario you mentioned, like a founder who was looking for their sort of successor, so to speak, because he wanted to exit the organization. And he was an executive director of an organization. He was like, well, I make like, I don't remember what the number was, but let's say $60,000. And I was like, that salary is about half of what the market that you're in is going to require for someone with the skill set you're looking for. He was like, well, my board is never going to agree to this. And I was like, well, you're an organization that's looking to advance equity and resources into underserved communities. So how are you supposed to address that by also creating an inequity in a role where you're asking someone to come in and work for half market rate? And so two things are going to happen there. You're either going to find someone who comes from significant economic privilege already that can afford it. And so how are you actually advancing your mission? Or on the other hand, now you're asking folks who are already disadvantaged economically for a whole bunch of things to continue to be disadvantaged. And like, how is that aligned with your mission? So that sometimes works too. Is we'll look at it from an equity lens. And if that's important to them, you got to walk the talk, right? Yeah, that's great. I mean, any way that we can, I think, help bring that logic <laughs> to help them connect is super helpful. And a lot of times 
I had somebody the other day say, well, you know, if they don't get it, they don't get it. And why waste our time? And I'm like, no, I've had so many times where I'm having these conversations with nonprofit executives, board members and whatnot. And suddenly they kind of get it and they go, oh, you're right. That doesn't make sense. Why do we do it that way? And there's always some people who just are not going to get it. But it's worth having the conversations and it's worth doing things like this so that we can get the word out and really help walk people down that path of there are better ways to do things than they've been done in the past sometimes. I think the nonprofit sector more broadly and some of the these kinds of myths that we carry, and there's like many of them, I think also stem from sort of how we want to be accountable to donors, right? And so for the longest time, and I've been a fundraiser for decades. And so at some point, someone came with this great idea that we should be demonstrating the impact of the work that we do by these like pie charts that says so much of your money goes directly to X, Y, Z, which is like so arbitrary and it makes no sense. But anyways, and so we've trained sort of a certain generation of donors to think that that's a good indicator. So whether you're effective at the role or not, and that I think that's changing. I think the new generation of donors, particularly millennials and probably Gen Z's, don't really care that much about that. I think what they care about is how many people did you help? Like, I don't really care how big is your marketing team? Like, were you actually able to help more people? And so I think if we just need to constantly check ourselves as are those things still true? And I think that they're maybe true for a very small percentage of donors. And it's all about how we communicate with them. Yeah. And bringing donors along in that, because I think you're right. So many Well, and even some of the charity watchdog groups like Charity Navigator and stuff, they look to those pie charts to give you a rating like, oh, you're spending this on it. And so it's kind of this unfair game where to really be effective, but also still get the good rating. You kind of have to game the system a little bit because it's kind of dumb. And we're not encouraging people to trust these nonprofits as the experts. We had somebody on a few months ago talking about how they've been working with a lot of nonprofits to get them to move toward unrestricted donations, because the nonprofits need that flexibility as things come up, as an opportunity presents itself, as they want to try something and experiment to be the experts in that area and not be beholden to a bunch of people or donors who are saying, nope, you got to spend it on this. Nope, you got to spend it on that. And they're like, that's great, but we don't need that. We need this. Well, I think that this is like, and we don't talk about that enough is the power dynamics in the nonprofit sector between of donors and programs or nonprofit professionals more broadly. And I think we got to change that a little bit. And how we do that is by sort of diversifying funding, because no matter how well intended even a donor is, if they're your main source of revenue, that power dynamic is always going to be skewed, whether that's big foundation, whether that's government grants, whether that's an individual. And so how do you change that dynamic? I think it's more like you got to be less beholden to only one source so that If you got to push a little bit, or if you think you're going to lose them, that's okay, because you have other sources you can go to, to balance that out. I think we've over relied on, and I see this a lot. I saw that a ton through the pandemic, where so many organizations were like, I have no idea what we're doing right now, because our main source of revenue is gone. So particularly around galas, right? Like that was the thing. So they had to think hard through that process. And I think there's so many more that can do that, particularly around foundation and grants, for example. I agree. Yeah. A lot of our clients on the creative agency side, nonprofit clients, the pandemic actually ended up spurring them. They were solving specific problems there, but now they kind of were in that problem solving mode. And now they're coming out of it going, well, wait, we could do that too. And there's new things to do. But I also like, I can think of one in particular where we were working with them and we're like, from a branding standpoint, we want to go in this direction. The staff is like, yes, we need to go in that direction. They had one board member who just gives a lot of money who was like, no, I don't want you to do that. And I'm not going to give if you do that. And, you know, that's not my place, but I'm just going, man, you can't let this one person hamstring you because you're so dependent on their check. But that's kind of the situation they found themselves in. Yeah. And that story all too common. But there was an article about a selection or sort of a task force of nonprofits. And I feel like it was in Chicago, but don't quote me on that part, who had decided to reimagine the way that they would do galas so that they can bring in more younger donors. When doing so, they had experimented with a whole bunch of other different fundraising ideas and sort of been like, okay, well, we're still going to do this thing because it generates revenue and whatnot. But now we're actually going to experiment and try and do a whole bunch of other things for people that are not that crowd. 
at all. And I think in doing so, they didn't realize that they actually had created a much more community-centric fundraising model and they diversified their fundraising to the extent where they were not so beholden on one particular event that had to happen because a board member felt strongly about it. But it was so interesting how they'd actually done it with the intention of trying to attract new donors, but they'd actually been so creative and innovative in the whole process on many levels. Yeah. And I've been encouraging, especially people starting new things, to work innovation and expertise into the foundations of who they are so that when when they are bringing donors in, that's part of what those people are coming in to support. If they can lead with that, then it's going to be a little bit easier because you're getting people buying in knowing that that's what you're going to do. But it's these older organizations that may already be sort of beholden to these big donors who, nope, this is the way we've always done it. We're not changing it. And you're like, (laughs) but you're not the one out here doing this. You don't know. And that becomes a bigger problem. Right. But these big donors also have children and grandchildren. That's a whole other thing. The intergenerational wealth transfer that's currently happening is going to impact charities. And and I've seen this. I've been in those rooms many times where if you don't have a clear strategy, sort of two decades in the making, you're going to lose all these big donors because you haven't engaged the next generation, which is not like their parents. And they're looking for that innovation and all of that. You're going to be in trouble regardless. Yeah. You got to make some tough decisions, really, or have some tough conversations, at least. I love talking to people like you who are working with a lot of nonprofits and sort of on the outside because you get to kind of see a range of issues and how people are doing. What is one of the most common maybe issues that you see come up as you work with nonprofits that you would want to speak to if nonprofit leaders are listening? And there's a thing that you're like, man, if I could say this to nonprofit leaders, this is what it would be. I could probably embed that you've gotten me to talk about fundraising a lot because that's sort of is my first love. (laughs) I've probably do this for hours, which I'm perfectly happy to do. But I think I have my finger on a pulse on talent side a little bit more. So I think that the message I would like to send to folks is you don't have to be super aggressive salary wise, and you don't always have to get the most experienced person in the room that you could get your hands on to make a good hire. So the Typical issue that happens in a lot of nonprofits is they'll post a role that underpays tremendously and they'll get someone very junior. And that junior person is not going to be set up for success because we don't invest in training. There's no mentoring. We don't give people a long runway anyways. And so people end up leaving the organizations or just not being successful. And so then the pendulum swings and everyone's like, okay, we're going to pay as much as we need to pay and we're going to get someone very experienced. So unless they've done this for 10 years, we're just not going to be interested in them. And then that's also not successful for very many other reasons. I think people need to realize that it's actually cheaper to promote from within. It's cheaper to train people up. And it's way, way, way cheaper to get someone with transferable skills from the for-profit sector, for example. Send them on a few conferences, mentor them for six months, and then they'll be up to speed and sort of running just like anybody else because they have the skills. But everybody's so scared to do that. Because they're like, I can't take a risk. I just need someone who's done the exact same job at the exact same context somewhere else. So naturally, those people are going to be very expensive to get to because they already are doing that same job in that same context. And so they're getting that same salary that you're able to offer. Um, So I think for me, the nonprofit sector does not have the talent pipeline it needs in order to fill all the leadership level positions that are there and are going to be there for the next decade or two. If we're going to make it, we're going to need to come up with a different way of coming at it from a talent perspective, and we'll need to take a chance on people who are not cookie cutter candidates. That's great. One thing I would add to that, I'd love to hear your your thoughts on this as well, is I've worked with a number of nonprofits where there's a specific task that needs to be done, and I think they want that outside perspective. And instead of saying, well, you need to hire a whole other role for that, or you have to hire outside for that. It's like, let's bring in a consultant to give that outside perspective and then hire based on what the findings there are. So it's not a long-term thing. We can bring in somebody who knows about that area, who can give some perspective and then help us figure out what it is that we need, which it sounds like a lot what you do. Yeah. And I think I was doing a CDO recruitment and we did our org assessment and I came back to the team and I was like, you want to hire two people. Like there's no way for what you're looking for, even if we were to get someone who is willing to do this whole job, they're never going to be successful because this is two people's job. So let's think about 
internally, what resources can you reallocate? And like, what part of those two people jobs do you need more so we can start there and then complementary hire around all the other stuff? Because you're just not setting people up for success. And that's really important to me. And it's even more important to me when people come to me and say, well, we really want a candidate who comes from a diverse background and is representative of the community as we serve and da, 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 da. And I was like, well, that's great. But I need your commitment that we're going to set them up for success. And we can't set people up for success if the expectations are this high and the rest of it is a mess. So I think that's a one way to go at it. But you consultants, I think, are can be very helpful. And I remember when I was, during my MBA, there was an MBA consulting startup in my business school or something like this. Their job was to do, they did a lot of feasibility studies and that kind of stuff. And so what usually happens is you have an entrepreneur of some sort. It could be also be an AOK company who's like, we have this new idea. We have no idea if it's going to work or not. But before we go ahead and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on it, how about we spend $10,000 on someone to go and do the research to see, figure out if it's actually like has legs or not. That's a way smaller, less risky investment than going and hiring a full-time person for it. So I think that's where consultants could be helpful. They could be that risk management factor. Absolutely. That's really great. We could talk forever. I'm like stopping my brain from going in a thousand different directions right now. But as you're looking at hiring and finding the right people, how do you account for diversity, inclusion, all of that as part of that? Is that a sort of a value center for you or is that something you look to the nonprofit to kind of guide you on or what does that look like? That's really, really important to our team. And so we try to approach all of the work that we do from an equity driven lens and that's every part of the process. So, and many times that process starts with, okay, well, dear board members, you've tasked me with this task and you've said that diversity is really important to you. How ready are you for that? Like, how much training have you done? How much training has the organization had? Do you have a DEI policy? How far along are you on that journey? And so ask those tough questions. And then on the other hand, having those same discussions that we just had around, well, what are you going to compromise on? So if this is really important to you. Like, we're not going to look for unicorns. We're not going to try and just raise the bar so high that nobody can actually meet your expectations. So you need to think creatively around how are you setting people up for success? What are your actual, like we call them the non-negotiables or the must-haves versus the nice-to-haves, right? And like some of those, like what is going to give? Because you can't have 10 must-haves, right? Like you can only have five. So we go through that process that really is getting people who are in the decision-making power to understand what that's going to take. And then on the other hand, then you build a process that you got to check yourself. And I have a lot of talented staff that will check us all the time. Anything from I rewriting this job description properly. Like for me, a job description that has a line at the bottom that says XYZ organization is an equal opportunity employer is not enough. Like that is not how you go about this at all. And so are we telling the right story? Are we speaking to the right folks from a marketing perspective? And then whenever we have a slate of shortlisted candidates, if that slate is not balanced, and it doesn't represent a multitude of identities, we go back to square one and we try to find more so that we have better and we have a lot to choose from because that is part of the process. And then going back to, we have to empower people to ask the right questions and make sure they're getting the information they need to make sure that that's the right choice for them as well. Because what has happened, I think in, we saw this a lot in 2021, there was a lot of organizations that jumped on the bandwagon of, we have a senior leadership position open, we must find a person of color because the rest of our team is very white, for example, and we got to diversify because everybody's scrutinizing us, right? Well, okay. So a lot of organizations did that, but then there's a whole bunch of people now who are exiting those organizations after a year or two going, there's too much change and I can't possibly be all responsible for it. Or the level of readiness that was communicated to me from the organization is not the reality of what's going on. And so that worries me the most. And that's what I try to prevent from happening the most if I can. Awesome. That's great. We could probably do a whole other episode just on that. And maybe I'll have you back and we'll do that because I think you probably have really great perspectives on that, being that you work with so many nonprofits and you're first generation, correct? Yeah. So obviously going to have a personal perspective on that and how that plays out too. And I'm so just fascinated by the way that that has become such a political hot button, unfortunately, but the way it's also such a necessary and important part of growing and our culture evolving and becoming more representative. There's many good lessons from the pandemic, and I hope that there's many silver linings that we get to keep 
hashtag save the work from home policies out there, but the work is not done. There's a long road to go, but we have to continuously dedicate ourselves to it because when organizations get it right, and I will speak from experience because I've recruited for organizations that center equity and are really committed and not only like they walk the talk, recruiting for those kinds of organizations is a joy because people feel comfortable putting their hand up. People feel empowered through the process. People are mission driven and they can raise the bar as high as they want to from a skill set perspective because everybody wants to work there because it's a welcoming place to work. So it is possible, but like it's a constant thing. It can't happen overnight. Yeah. And one hire isn't like, okay, we did it. All right. Well, as we wrap up, we end with some closing questions that we ask everybody. And these are kind of rapid fire questions, rapid fire answers. What's the one thing that makes you most feel connected? Talking to people. Always a good one. Who in the world of nonprofits would you most like to take to lunch? (laughs) Kashana Palmer. Oh, who's that? Ooh, okay. So if you don't know Kashana Palmer, you should know her. There's so many things that one can say about her. You have to have met her, but she is a consultant. She's been a public speaker and a trainer and an executive coach and has done a ton of turnaround projects in different organizations. She's based in New York, but the most fascinating person you'll ever meet and sort of brings a level of energy in a room that is amazing. Like you can visualize it when she walks in the room as to the amount. Of- I love those people. Fires, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to guess that I know the answer to the next question, which is who in the world of nonprofit do you think we should interview next? She would be a good choice, but if the repeats are not allowed, <laughs> I would probably have to say my good friend Tanya Rumble is probably one person that you would find very insightful to have a conversation with. Tanya's done a tremendous amount of work in creating safe spaces for folks to think about the intersection of philanthropy and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Like those kinds of tough questions of like, okay, I don't really want to take this money because of XYZ, but it's also $10 million for my organization. Like, what do I do? I think Recast Philanthropy is a space that allows that. And there's thousands of people that engage in those conversations on a regular basis. So I think that you will find her notes interesting. Okay. And finally, what aspect of your job brings you the most joy? Okay. So this is fresh off the press, I think. I had a colleague that sent me a note saying I was at an AFP, which is the Association of Fundraising Professional. It was like, I was at a happy hour and I met this woman who had met you as part of a recruitment I was doing. And apparently I'd given her some advice on sort of how to manage her career and how to get to the job that, by the way, she was not the successful candidate for the role that I was recruiting for. But apparently that sort of sparked her entire sort of reframing and mindset around what she wanted to get out of her career. And she was able to get the promotion she wanted. She advanced her career. And she was like, she sings your praises. And I was like, that is why I do the work I do is because something I say, which at the moment, I don't even remember what I said, to be honest, has like set people up to where they want to be. And that is super fulfilling for me. I love that. And I get to do that a lot. That is one of the best things. I taught high school straight out of college for a few years. You know, it's been 20 something years since I've done that. And every once in a while, I'll still get a note or a message, an email, a Facebook message, something from a student. And they'll I'll never forget when you said this one thing. And I have no recollection of saying that. But for them, it was this life-changing, important thing that they've hung on to. And I'm like, if I can be in the right place at the right time and be used to share something like that that helps people, then that's great. That's just so wonderful to hear. I get thanked the most when I reject candidates. And because I, <laughs> I, so I would say it straight up, like, I don't think this is going to be the right role for you. And here's the three reasons why. And this is how I think you can be more competitive next time around. They're like, oh my God, no one's ever given me feedback. <laughs> like, oh, That's really great. Well, where can people find you and find more information about your organization? I live on LinkedIn. So that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. But Charity Search Group, dot com is obviously our domain and you can find all our entire team and connect with them there as well. And they are pretty awesome. So I like to say that I'm here representing the organization today, but that being said, I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for a very large and extremely talented team that helps me. And it's probably one of the other most fulfilling parts of my job is that I get to work with very talented people who care about the nonprofit sector just as much because we're all fundraisers for the most part. We are always up for talking to people. So if you ever need anything, a conversation is not that far away. Nice. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Maria. Thanks for being here. And this has been really helpful and enlightening. Well, well, there you have it. This episode of Nonprofit Connect with Matt Barnes brought to you by Rogue Creatives is over. 
It's done. Finished. What are you going to do with the rest of your day? You're going to take the dog for a walk, maybe have some dinner. But before you do any of those things, could you do us a massive favor and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Music or Spotify or wherever else you listen to us? Obviously, you don't have to, but, you know, be very, very appreciated. Oh, and if you want to hear more from us, visit our website at npconnect.roguecreatives.com. That's npconnect, like Nonprofit Connect, dot roguecreatives.com. We'll see you soon. Nonprofit Connect with Matt Barnes is hosted and executive produced by me, Matt Barnes, with an assist by my chaos coordinator, Tiffany Pope. Production is by our amazing friends over at Fame, the B2B podcast agency, along with Belinda Carter Thompson and the team here at Rogue Creatives. Production lead is Luke Audi at Fame. Writing is by Sam Hollis at Fame and Matt Barnes and Taylor Bolanos from Rogue Creatives. Nemanja Koljaja of Fame is our audio editor and Arslan Yakub from Fame is our video editor. Creative direction is by Corey Hill of Rogue. Our artwork is designed by Hope O'Kelly and Joshua Marino at Rogue and Ian Salas of Fame. Theme music is composed and performed by Jared Atherton of Chapters. Luke Audi of Fame does our booking and our guest relations. Huge thanks to our amazing guests for joining us for this episode and to all of you incredible listeners for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, and I don't know why you wouldn't have, don't forget to help us spread some good by giving us a good review. Preferably, you know, five stars with lots of words saying how amazing we are on whatever platform you're listening on. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever it is. Also, tell your friends and subscribe so we can come straight into your potholes each and every time we have a new episode. For more information about Nonprofit Connect or to join us at a live event here in Orange County, California, visit our website, npconnect.roguecreatives.com. We'll catch you next time. This has been a Rogue Creatives production.